أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ريفيو السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته In these episodes that we've been discussing we have looked at the chapter of Yusuf, we've looked at principles of morality which we've been able to extrapolate from this surah, from this story, which is the longest chronological story mentioned in one chapter in the Holy Quran. We are looking at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking care of Yusuf, how Yusuf is relying upon Allah at every step of the way how he has no one else to rely upon and how Allah is unfolding his plan. Using the plan of others, Allah is unfolding his own plan. We've also been looking at the emphasis that the Ahlul Bayt have placed on reciting and contemplating on the Quran. Without this book, you and I would have no guidance. The Ahlul Bayt have emphasized continuously how to recite the Quran, when to recite the Quran how we should sit when we recite the Qur'an, that the fact that we should even have a good fragrance from our mouth when we should recite the Qur'an. There are etiquettes that have been mentioned with regards to reciting the Holy Qur'an. One of the etiquettes that I'd like to touch upon in this episode is the etiquette of reciting the Qur'an in a beautiful voice. The Holy Prophet mentions this as one of the requirements, one of the etiquettes when somebody recites the Holy Qur'an. When we think about a good voice, what may come to our minds is moving in high and low rhythmic fashion to move your voice in such a manner in which you are singing the Holy Quran or reciting it in a melodious tone. Rather, the Ahlul Bayt have a different take on it. The Ahlul Bayt, the Prophet peace be upon him, says that the best of voices is that voice that when you hear it, you understand that it fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when an individual comes across a verse of heaven, he becomes ecstatic about it. And when he comes across a verse of hell, you can tell by his voice that he's fearful of hell or she's fearful of hell. When this individual comes across verses that increase their hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should tell from their voice. You can tell from the complexion on their face, their expression on their face, that this individual understands what they're saying and is trying to make this Quran a part and parcel of them is trying to mix it with their flesh and with their blood. Of course, this is not possible without understanding the Qur'an and knowing its meaning. And that's why many a time in these episodes, we have continuously encouraged that you and I should go back to learning this language if we have not done so. If we don't know this language, then we should try and exert effort in understanding. There are so many available courses to learn Arabic. They're online, they're at people's houses, they're in our mosques. We can't neglect it. We shouldn't have a reason not to learn at least words from this language. You know, so many words in the Quran are repeated that if every day we learn five words, ten words from the Holy Quran, within a few months we'll know a lot of the Quran. We'll understand. Yes, we won't know the grammar. Yes, we won't know the nuances that I mentioned inside. But at least we will know more than we did when we started off. This will only bring about a greater taste and sweetness when we begin to recite the Quran. In our discussion in Surah Yusuf, we have come to the stage where we see that Yusuf is being taken care of by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he came to the door and the door flung open, he saw that Aziz was standing there, a child from the family of Zulaikha was there as well, and the child spoke out. And because of the child's confession, because of the child's statement, Yusuf was no longer seen as the perpetrator of a crime, but rather was seen as the victim. Word gets out to the chief ladies of the town that this is what has happened to the wife of the Aziz and now they are concerned and they want to see what is it? What is it that is infatuating the wife of the Aziz? 
the wife of the Aziz herself, Zulaikha, doesn't want her reputation to be ruined. So what she does is that she brings about a conducive environment for these ladies. She calls the ladies to the palace. They come to the palace and she gives each of them a fruit and a knife in their hands. She asks them to cut the fruit and at the same time she calls Yusuf out. As Yusuf comes out and they see the beauty of this man, وَقُلْنَ حَاشَ لِلَّهِ مَا هَذَا بَشَرًا إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا مَلَكٌ كَرِيمٌ They say, glory be to Allah. They say, this is not a human, this is not a man, this is not a being, this must be an angel. It's impossible that such beauty can be given to a human being. Initially, it was just Zulaikha that wanted to seduce Yusuf. Only Zulaikha wanted to commit a crime. After the women who were laughing at Zulaikha actually saw Yusuf themselves, they too became individuals who fell at the feet of Yusuf. They too became infatuated with Yusuf. Zulaikha says, this is what you are taunting me about. This is what you are accusing me of, this individual. Yes, it's true, I tried to seduce him, Fasta'sam. It's very important to understand in verse 32. Zulaikha herself admits, confesses, and she says, Fasta'sam, that he kept away from me. He protected himself. The same root that we use for Asma, Asama. He has protected himself from me. That means he didn't even incline towards her. If he inclined, if he took a step and then changed his mind and ran away, Zulaikha wouldn't have said that he protected himself. She wouldn't have used such a strong word to say that he completely distanced himself from me. It was me who was trying to seduce him and he kept himself away from me. Then Zulaikha says, now if he doesn't do what we command him to do, what I'm commanding him to do, then we shall put him in prison. So now she, she gives Yusuf an option. Either you do what we command you to do, or we put you in prison. At this time now, it's not just Zulaikha who is trying to uh, commit this heinous act. It's Zulaikha as well as the rest of the women. All of them are trying to corner Yusuf. And this is when Yusuf comes out with this profound statement. And he says, قَالَ رَبِّ السِّجْنُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا يَدْعُونَنِي إِلَيَّ Oh my Lord, prison is more beloved to me as a result compared to what they're calling me to. On one side, they're calling me to this act. On the other, they're telling me that I can go to prison. Some have misunderstood this and they have said that Yusuf is asking Allah to put him in prison. Yusuf is not doing dua that oh Allah put me in prison. He is telling God that God, these are the two options that they have given me. One is that right now I do what they ask of me and that brings about your displeasure, which is not possible for me to do. The other one is for me to accept to go into prison. But in going into prison, I do not bring about your displeasure. I bring about your pleasure because I'm not doing the other act. For this reason, Yusuf says that, Oh my Lord, going to prison is more beloved to me than doing what they'd like me to do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes their plot because Yusuf continues in this verse. And he says, وَإِلَّا تَصْرَفْ عَنِّي كَيْدَهُنَّ If, O oh Allah, if you do not remove their plots and their trickery and their plans from me, I fear that I might fall into their actions when I'm unaware. Not intentionally. Maybe I'm trying to run away from the room and now they've cornered me and they are physically more than me, so maybe they will be able to attack me. Maybe I might fall into that sin because of them attacking me. Oh Allah, I don't want that to happen. So remove these plans and trickery from them and I prefer prison. This is a proof to me, O oh Allah, that I prefer even prison compared to doing something that will bring about your displeasure. Sometimes people cannot understand. But why is it that a man would prefer to waste his life in prison compared to doing some action and then forgetting about it and at least he'll be a free man? Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in Nahj al-Balagha in the Sermon of Hammam, Sermon of the Muttaqeen as it's famously known, he says a beautiful sentence. He says, فَالْمُتَّقُونَ فِيهَا The God-weary individuals, the individuals who are conscious about God in this dunya, هُمْ أَهْلُ الْفَضَائِلِ They are people of distinction. They are people of merit. No one can match them. They stand above the rest. They shine out. 
You can tell that these people have merit. They place God on a pedestal. They prioritize God over everything else. Imam continues and he says, They have given God the greatest seat in their hearts. So everything else in their eyes has become belittled and become petty. When you place God in your heart and you give Him the greatest of stations and seats in your heart, then everything else is petty to you. Nothing else matters. Prison, so let it be. So long as my Lord's pleasure is in prison, then I shall go to prison. So Amir al-Mu'mineen salam says that even if you put me in hellfire, it's not the hellfire that I am worried about. It's not the pain of the hellfire. The pain that's going to kill me is separation from you, oh my Lord. Hellfire of heaven, what's the difference? I want to go to that place where you are present. I want to go to that place where your proximity is present. I want to go to that place where I can see you and I can witness you and I can love you and I can taste this love. That of course is paradise. There are people who are fallible, who have got to a station where the Prophet said about them, Innal jannata lis Salman ashwaq min Salman ilal jannah that heaven was yearning for Salman to enter it more than Salman was yearning to enter into heaven. Heaven does not become their goal anymore. Paradise is not their goal. The pleasure of Allah is their goal. Wherever the pleasure of Allah lies, that's where they shall begin to run. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will only test us in accordance with our capability. When we read this chapter of Yusuf and we see the test after test that he is going in, we should not think that Allah will do this to everybody that he loves. No, Allah will test those that he loves so that he can purify their hearts and cleanse that love to make it a sincere love that has no ulterior motives. Just like when you want to purify gold, when gold is mined, it has to go through an intense heat process so that it can be melted, the dirt can go away and pure gold can remain. In the same way, a believer's heart is tested by Allah to their capacity and capability. It would be unjust of Allah to test you in a manner which you would not have the capability to pass that test. He will only test you with those tests that you're able to pass, that He's given you the potential and the tools to pass this test. So when we see these great tests that are coming about on Yusuf, we should immediately conclude that his capacity, his vessel was so great that he could take these tests and with every test that he passed, Allah increased his station and gave him something greater. Allah mentions in the Quran that we send down rain فَسَالَتْ أَوْدِيَةٌ بِقَدَرِهَا We send down rain and then the rain flows in the valleys according to the capacity of the valleys. The larger the valley, the more rain can gush forth. The Prophet peace be upon him had the greatest vessel his tests were the greatest of tests. Our, great, our tests are petty in comparison to His, but our tests are great in comparison to our capacity. We are tested by our capacity. And so every test that comes before you, you have the choice of complaining about it, or you have the choice of saying, Allah, thank you for testing me, because through this test, I'll be able to achieve a greater station. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this holy month of Ramadan, to make us individuals who become so steadfast that when He tests us, we do not complain. Rather, we thank Him and we seek for His protection, His ability, His tawfiq that He should give us, that we can pass these tests with flying colors. We should never turn to Allah and ask Allah, why did you choose me? Rather, we should turn to Allah and say, thank you for finding me worthy of this test and help me to pass them with your pleasure. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين